Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Sarah Frazier, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing for Percuto. And on behalf of myself, the entire Percuto team, and our speakers, I hope you all are staying safe and healthy. In my career, I've been through recessions, downturns, and hard times, but this period is definitely unique. So whether you've been completely displaced, you've been furloughed, perhaps your company has hiring freezes in place, or you're simply overwhelmed from the unexpected spike that this pandemic has created, we want to be sensitive to your situation and help answer the question of where do we go from here? Thus, our webinar today is about developing a contingency plan for marketing operations. Before we jump into our discussion, just a few housekeeping reminders. We are recording today's presentation and we'll send out a link to everyone along with a link to access the resources that are mentioned. Note our format today is a little bit different than our other webinars in that once we get into the presentation, there are no slides. We intended this to be an informal discussion of your marketing operations peers so that you can get their live and candid responses to the questions presented. And speaking of questions, if you have a question for one of our speakers who are uh, speaking today, please click on the chat or question button on the right hand side of your screen, type in your question or comment, and we'll do our very best to address it in the conversation today. I always think it's helpful to know the context of our presenters. Since we have two speakers today from Percuto, I'll go ahead and introduce our company. For those of you who are not familiar with Percuto, we help leading brands orchestrate memorable customer experiences through flawless marketing operations. Comments you'll hear today are based on our experience in over a thousand Marketo projects and working with enterprise clients in many different industries. Percuto is an Adobe Platinum partner with specialization in Marketo Engage. We have employees throughout the world and our headquarters are in Montreal. Okay, so let's go ahead and get to our presentation. For our speakers today, we have four Marketo champions, so an all-star team, and they each represent a different point of view. We have an agency, a large organization, and a smaller startup. Let's meet them. Alex Peltier is the CEO and co-founder of Percuto, and he was Marketo customer 163 back in the day. He has over 20 years of experience in marketing and marketing automation. Also joining us is Justin Norris, who's the Director of Solutions Architecture at Percuto. Justin has 11 years of experience in marketing, and eight of those are in sales and marketing operations specifically. Also joining us is Helen Abramova, and she is the Senior Technology Lead at an enterprise te telecommunications company with 12 plus years of experience um, in marketing, specializing in marketing operations and automation. Finally, we have Kelly Jo Horton, who is the Principal Engineer of Marketing Operations and Technology at Room, and she is an award-winning digital marketer. And as you can see, she's also a runner from all the medals in the background. Um, finally, Alex will be facilitating our discussion from here. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to you, Alex. Thank you very much, Sarah. I really do appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here uh, with all of you today. Uh, we have great uh, speakers as uh, Sarah introduced, all of you guys uh, and girls. So I would like to essentially make a, a little bit of a point on how we decided to break the different questions we got. Uh, and we want to, you know, make it into three main categories. First, how did you initially react uh, to the situation? Uh, what did you do with the things that have been happening uh, right away? Uh, and then what was the response? So what were the subsequent actions that, uh, you know, you guys took in your organization or your customers took. Uh, and then lastly, how are you repositioning, right? The uh, marketing operation to the new normal or for a better future. So, uh, you know, some of the questions will be flowing around those different, uh, you know, categories. Um, so I'd like to start maybe, um, you know, as a, as a first question, um, what happened in your uh, marketing operations um, that you didn't expect and how did you respond to it 
you know, what would you do differently if there's anything next time? So uh, maybe I can start with uh, Kelly, Joe, you as a first speaker, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Um, the first thing is, uh, in when this happened, I was in the middle of a migration from HubSpot to Marketo, so that in it of itself was kind of an interesting point to be in. But the most surprising thing for me was that we actually decided to accelerate our roadmap um, in the middle of all this because we thought we would take advantage of the down a little bit of a quiet downtime to accelerate the roadmap. So things that I had on the roadmap for Q3 have been just pushed forward and um, so we implemented, you know, decided to implement three new platforms and work on things that had had been scheduled for, for Q3. So it actually accelerated some things um, that we thought be a great use of time while things had slowed down a bit. That's definitely unexpected. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> Good feedback. Um, Ellen, do you want to go? She's uh, on mute. I think you're on mute. Or Justin, Not do you want to so go? Uh, oh no, you're back. Honest, okay, good. I don't... You're good. I heard Helen for a minute. <laughs> how do, how how do, you oh, there you there you are. Yep. Perfect. <laughs> we lost you again, uh, Helen. Okay. Oh, All right. So have... um, now you're good. It's Okay, let me dial in and okay. I, I'll go to okay. Justin for so, this question. Um, you can dial in. I guess it's yeah, a, I'm disappearing a again. Yeah, yeah, I mean, well, well okay. Helen does that. I, I think I think it, I think it's it's varied, and I'll, I'll respond based on the context of what um, I'm seeing across some of the clients we work with, rather than just Procuro specifically. Uh, but I think it's varied, and it's based on the customer and how uh, what their exposure is to the economic changes that are going on. You know, broadly speaking, we've seen some clients that we were speaking to halt new projects. They've had spending freezes, um, you know, that sort of thing. On the other hand, I know we've had people absolutely scrambling and needing more help than ever. You know, converting uh, live conferences to virtual events, transferring more energy to digital marketing. Uh, which you know I think is, is probably fairly common for lots of folks. So it really seems to run the gamut, you know, based on who you serve and how you're being affected by what's going on right now. And and from that um, until Ellen gets back, what 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 adjustment you know to the MOPS, uh, you know, workflows or processes or, or operations essentially uh, could you say uh, that you've seen implemented at some of the customers that were, you know, immediately reacted to this? Well, I, I think what it exposes first and foremost is where our processes are lacking. Um, the real person context that we have where we can just grab someone and, and you know, pull them into a meeting room or head over to the water cooler and, and just catch someone in person to some extent is a mask for um, the dysfunction that can lurk within many organizations and every organization has its share. Um, so in the absence of that, where you're not there face to face anymore, you may be communicating asynchronously. You may not have uh, a streamlined uh, digital friendly way of doing something. You know, that is immediately exposed by the change of the situation. To some extent, that's healthy because, you know, once you identify that problem, you can fix it. Um, so I think, you know, just speaking broadly from looking at, you know, commentary in the industry and, and folks that I'm speaking with, um, that's one of the, one of the big things I think is, is you see what you're lacking. And then of course there's an opportunity to fill that gap. That makes total sense. Uh, and yeah, you, you, you've been seeing definitely a lot of conversation around that. Um, Ellen, do we have you back online now? Do you hear me okay? Yes. yes, that works. Perfect. Cool. So <laughs> Ben, if I go back, what happened to you that you didn't expect essentially when this thing uh, you know, started? I can tell that the biggest thing that happened, um, what I experienced, is um, the level of uncertainty is just like went up. So after that, it's very hard to uh, plan to speak to your 
um, strategy to like everything. You basically need to uh, question every single step, every single task you're working on. And lots of projects are going on hold or campaigns are going to be revised or something like this. And this is where you have to be flexible and wise and strong enough to make sure that things are still going and we are not losing, we are not dropping any balls. At the same time, um, um, be ready that everything might change every single time, every single minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. There's no more uh, solid foundation on what we can rely. Things are up in the air. Uh, that really, really created that uncertainty that you, uh, you referred to. So. I can definitely see that. So, and then what were the different adjustments that you made uh, quickly uh, in, in your operations uh, to kind of help uh, navigate through this? I think the biggest um, goal that I'm pursuing right now is looking into ultimate um, objectives that we are trying to achieve and sticking to them. So understanding that um, there are still things that we can do and keep up and running while we adjust and while we are like uh, observing what's going on around us and making sure that we are not um, holding anything critical. That's probably the most important part um, right now. And I know it might be sounding a little bit um, kind of uh, academic, but basically uh, stick to the most important part, like to the most critical uh, work stream, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Critical work. Yeah. I can I can answer that too of things that we did immediately. I mean, there was an unexpected change, right? And you also have to understand that I'm on the engineering side for the most part. So um, I'm not per se like a an email automation mark uh, marketer. So, but I do work very closely with all the other teams because we're a very small company. We're under 50 people. So um, some of the actually immediate actions that we took um, were to pause any automated nurtures to check content to make sure we weren't being tone deaf on anything, to pause any sales outreach that was going on. And I'm telling you, I was still receiving some really tone deaf outreach from salespeople for weeks afterwards because they hadn't stopped to breathe and check those things. We also, evaluated all of our paid advertising um, to see if any of the images were going to you know not be appropriate at this time um, because we we do make soundproof phone booths and um, so people sitting in the phone booths making sure that those um, you know images were appropriate right now um, so those sorts of things, just sort of taking a pause for once, because in this job, you never get to stop and breathe. There's really never a time when you get to stop and breathe and slow down and like sort of evaluate everything. So just pausing everything and actually taking stock, reviewing content and, um, you know, no uh, just knee-jerk reactions and saying, oh gosh, we have to send out an email about COVID, which we all know we've probably gotten a hundred of them, right? Immediately, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. I think it's always beneficial. Like we, we, it's almost like we always wanted to have those pause, but because of the typical workflow workload, we're never able to get those uh, moments yeah. of, you know, looking back. Uh, it's almost like it's a, it's it's created that opportunity at least for you to uh, make sure that everything got revisited and and you know, validated. So yeah, okay, that's pretty good. Um, have you seen any repurposed budget like from obviously events or more like in-person marketing? Uh, you know, activities have all been canceled or pushed back. Um, have you seen any movements of budget from? those tactics towards more digital marketing? Uh, and if so, how does that impacted your ability to execute those campaigns? Because it's not because you have more money right now to do more campaigns that you necessarily have the bandwidth or the capabilities and, and stuff like that internally. So um, I don't know, Ellen, do you want to start maybe take a peek at that one? Right. Um, I think that big companies are still kind of um, trying to understand where the money right now available and where to put them in. And in some cases, it's obvious, like if you have like Adobe um, 
Adobe has had to cancel their summit, so obviously they have some kind of, you know, budget available. At the same time, uh, they're shifting from um, um, live events to virtual events, and uh, they were sharing their um, thoughts on that, saying that like it still it still costs money <laughs> to run this event. It's not for free, and I think this is exactly what's happening. To understand that uh, digital doesn't mean that it's free, right? And it's sometimes it's like more thoughtful, more um, complicated, not that much obvious how, like what you have to do to achieve what you want to achieve, especially as now everyone is live and digital and like there is no live events anymore. So we are competing with like everything and everyone and it, it's kind of like, it's changing the game, but uh, it's still a high competition for the attention. At the same time, um, I would say that uh, I feel that a lot of my peers do that. We are still working kind of like in the same matrix of uh, what has been planned. And I'm looking into like some significant changes probably like down the road while we are uh, adjusting our strategy and we understand what we are going moving forward. Okay, great. Uh, Justin, any feedback from customers on, on how they manage to essentially take uh, additional workload from campaign execution standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we probably have some proximity bias because obviously, because they're our customers, they're relying on agency support, and and so you know we're there to help them. Um, that's obviously not everybody's situation. It's not an option for everyone. Uh, I think a lot of people are working more hours, and uh, even though they are home, their quality of life is impacted, you know, stress level impacted, and I I get that feedback as well from some of my peers in the community. Um, so. Not every, not everybody has that capability, but uh, but yeah, people are having to do more with less, and you know that's part of the challenge of this time, I think. It, it seems that it has always been the case for MUPS, right? To do more with less, and now yeah. you feel that this <laughs> is probably... even more with even less. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So how how did you cope with this, uh, Kelly Joe, on your end? Uh, assuming there was a surge in demand for new type of you know, campaigns and activities? So we um, actually have kept our our planned marketing calendar the way it was. The only thing that actually changed, right, is there's, because there's no live events we're attending or conferences, um, those all stopped. Um, we did, you know, change our paid media spend for sure. We cut back a lot until we could figure out exactly what, what was going on. and. Um, where or if we should be spending money on certain paid media. Um, we reprioritized some hires. We have actually hired two new people during this time. Um, and so it, but they aren't, they aren't MOPS people, but it just reprioritizing sort of the, the people we wanted to hire and the initiatives that we uh, wanted to do. We're still launching a new product. The product roadmap is still the same. Um, and so it's just, you know, we have to think of it differently because our product is built for open office spaces and nobody's going to work right now. So we've had to, uh, you know, pivot, you know, a lot. But, but I mean, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. We can see people, you know, starting to think about reopening and, and that sort of thing. But, yeah, so for, for budget, we just sort of, you know, accelerated the roadmap and, and I implemented three new platforms, a data warehouse and, and some other things. And, um, but that budget wasn't gonna be spent until Q3 and it just, we just accelerated that and sort of moved it that way. So it's just been sort of moved around a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, okay, so then, at least the fact that you don't necessarily have a surge in new different campaigns, you you were able to move those projects ahead of time, right? Uh, earlier. Yeah, it just you know, like like Justin was saying, I've worked you know I've worked a lot of weekends, you know, and mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of long hours because of moving moving these projects up. It didn't take anything else off my plate, right? It just added. Mm -hmm. So our I would say that a lot of our roles and responsibilities have actually expanded because we're so small and in startups you wear many hats anyway but my role greatly expanded because we 
you know, had on the hiring roadmap a person who would be in charge of, you know, our BI tool and our and our data warehouse. And that ended up just shifting over to my plate to build those out. So that in that sense, yes, I've, we've all taken on a lot more a variety of roles and things that we hadn't been doing before um, or things that we had on the roadmap for someone else to do. Um, so just for me, it's a it's it's been a really expanded role on the technology side. And now also with the migration, I'm also responsible for building out all the emails and that sort of thing too. So it's a lot. Okay. And do you see some openness from from your uh, your executive, or at least to get some of the hire that you had planned, or at this point uh, it's still in wait mode. I I think um, you know, like I said, we have hired two people, um, mm -hmm. not in mops, and because we're so small, we we won't have a mops team. I'm a team of one, mm -hmm. so. Um, you know that that's down the road and that was always planned on being down the road so this didn't actually affect right. any hires for for my particular role uh eventually of course uh this you know actually one of the other things i did right immediately when this happened is i said i offered to train people on marketo in the company and i started mm -hmm. doing internal trainings and so i could have backup mm -hmm. for these times when i'm really busy doing these other things you know, I now have another person on in marketing who's building out emails and newsletters and things on her own. Um, but these are people who had zero exposure to Marketo before the whole pandemic happened. But I just offered to do internal training for anyone who wanted to learn it. So it helps me. It builds a backup queue for me, you know, backup people for me. And also, you know, it's a good time to educate the rest of the company on on what I do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love that idea. Uh, we, we often don't advertise enough the role and what's being done at the MOPS uh, position. And I think it's a great, great idea to be able to uh, to do that using that potential uh, period to uh, to expose it more and get more help. Uh, very, very good creative way to do it. Um, so if I want to jump maybe to, you know, what can we do moving forward, right? Uh, how can we reposition basically uh, the marketing operation role? And I'm asking this because there's a, there's a quote going on, uh, you know, you guys probably all have read it, but it's a, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. I forgot who said that, but uh, the point here is how, you know, how can MUPS today support your organization in this recovery? Like how can you take advantage of the situation and to support the organization as part of the uh, the re part of the recovery. So, uh, Helen, do you want to? Yeah. So I really think that it's important for every one of us to assess our like personal and professional situation because we all understand and the reality and complexity of what's going on is like it's all different. I really love this uh, uh, thing uh, that we are in the same boat, but we are not at the same storm. And some companies are doing like okay and people are normally fine and just like bored and some people are really really struggling and if not more right and like it's all happening at the same time and because of that we probably need to be very careful in terms of like where i am and like where my company is in this situation and what is um what is potential outcome short term and long term and like what shall i expect and some companies are trying not to uh do any layoffs or even like legend to not doing it, which is, I believe, really, really awesome. And this is exactly where I, I feel like the leadership should look into. Um, at the same time, like I understand that small business or mid-sized business might be struggling heavily. And in, if this is the case, then like it's better to, to understand and um, like have this plan. If, for example, something can happen with my role, what I'm going to do? Do I need to review my resume? Do I need to shake up my connections? Do I need to look out around, like, are there any open positions around? So something like this, like, if, if there is any chance that there might be some kind of layoff. And kind of, like, from the worst case scenario or, like, bad case scenario to kind of up of, like, what maybe nothing really is going to change for me dramatically, like, in a big 
scope of uh, things. And um, I also think that, um, as you said, like it's uh, a terrible thing to waste. Um, I think this is a chance to, to bring like the best of us in this conversation. I also, like I, I'm saying, I wish I can tell that uh, it was so easy and nice and rosy before. It was not. <laughs> it was always challenging, and everyone was pretty much understaffed and kind of like wearing multiple hats and working long hours. So I'm saying, yes, it's changing. It's getting worse. It's getting like less serious and less um, easy to manage. But I'm saying like we've been there, right? Like it, it wasn't just like absolutely no problem before. That's why um, brace your core and try to, to do the best of what you can do. That's kind of <laughs> do I... mm. and, and do you think, just a side question, so do you think it's going to help shed lights on the marketing operation role in itself? Potentially, yes. Potentially. Like I'm saying, depending on what your storm is, if someone will be able to see this light, yes, 100% agree. If it's like a like a huge hurricane and you won't be able to even like to 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 manage it, probably like but we have to be realistic. It might be very different for different uh, industries and companies. Um, but if the company is doing okay and uh, it's a big opportunity for all marketing operations to like start this like true digital approach and show the value of marketing ops and explain and kind of like pick up a little bit of leadership, pick up a little bit of spotlight of what we are doing, why we are doing, what we can teach and what we can share, like what kind of insights do we have and all kinds of things. And I think that this is the way we probably need to be more leaders and more communicators than we normally do because uh, in many cases we are just kind of like behind the scenes, <laughs> heavy lifters. Uh, maybe we should step in and start um, advising, consulting, um, helping out with like bigger picture and strategy questions. Okay, this is good. Uh, and for you, uh, Kelly Joe, how do you feel uh, MUPS can support your organization in the recovery? I think the biggest gift you can give your organization is data. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we accelerated our roadmap to put in these platforms for data, a data pipe, a, um, a data warehouse, and a BI tool. So what, this, what we're doing is we're trying to prepare for when business comes back. So taking this slow time. So as a MOPS person, I mean, this is a great time to look at the quality of your data and provide any actionable data to the business. Um, because they they need to make decisions. They need to see, you know, the funnel and you know if what it looks like and what the projections are. And so for me, I think that is the 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 best thing that any MOPS person can do right now is really provide data to the business. Um, whether it's going to calm them down or cause more anxiety, you know, it depends on what company you work for. But um, you need the data to make decisions and to sort of see the future. And it's really nice if you start seeing the uptick, right? If you've seen this big crash in a, in a you know, in one of your dashboards, and then all of a sudden you see sales or interest start creeping back up. I mean, it, it shows a little bit of a positive trend. I mean, that's nice. Hopefully that happens for everybody eventually, or it starts to happen. But I'm, I, I'm all about the data. Provide data to your business, and and um, yeah, because they need it for decisions. Absolutely. I mean, I I couldn't agree more. Uh, yesterday I published a story of one of our customer who actually leveraged through data to make the sound decisions while navigating early on the crisis. Because of course the you know, the, the initial uh, reaction was like, oh my God, we need to shut down this, we need to do that. And based on no fact, no data, right. it was just emotional, just opinion. And then uh, they were able, because they had put in place that infrastructure, because they were able to get earlier, um, you know, last year and whatsoever, but they, they had the data point to just go back to the executive and say, hey, look, wait a minute. Like we just need to put the emotion aside and look at what the data is showing and then those indicators are not what the emotion that we're feeling is. It's not linked. Right. So they were able to, you know, bring that. So I 100% agree with the the fact that data is is definitely key in those situations. And I would like to add on that that uh, not only data as numbers, but what it all means. 
right? Because in many cases, like the way you interpret the data is the key. <laughs> like what kind of story you're shaping around this data is super important because you can, right. and again, we also need to understand what, like who, where this data coming from and is it validated? Is it true? Because I've seen lots of situations when uh, the same type of reports can be put like in, you know, a hundred different ways and every single way might be kind of correct one. <laughs> it's just the matter of how you interpret, how you are putting it in a bigger context and picture. And again, this is where we can step in as leaders and explain what it means, how we shall proceed from what we see and uh, like drive those insights from these uh, numbers and charts and everything. Absolutely. Um, Justin, do you want to add uh, anything from uh customer's point of view? Yeah, I mean, I agree with the points from Kelly, Joe, and Helen. I think um, I think that's spot on. From, from my perspective, you know, when things get shaken up, uh, it exposes some things that are wrong, but to the perspective of, you know, not letting the crisis go to waste, it also creates opportunity to make changes. And operations people um, are, are focused on how business gets done. So in a situation where things are in flux, when there is a crisis, we're very well positioned to step in and show leadership. Um, companies are trying to, to keep moving and we can enable that. And I think for operations people, I mean, there's, you could rattle off a dozen things. I mean, three things just off the top of my head. Um, if you've been struggling with your campaign requisition process, now is a great time to fix that. Work on how you communicate with the rest of your team, uh, implement some better SLAs. Do it in such a way that it's, you know, exposing the benefit for everybody. Hey, it's, things have changed. We need to tighten up our communication, tighten up our process, get people on board with that. Um, focus on getting your stuff documented and published. You know, if um, your lead management workflow, if your routing workflows, if you're scoring, if that's all in your head, your company's at risk. So take the time to get that documented, get it published somewhere. Um, you can justify very easily that expensive time. You know, if you personally get sick or if someone on your team gets sick, uh, that needs to be accessible where everybody can see it. Um, also spend time getting closer, like with your executive stakeholders to uh, the point, I, I can't remember if it was Helen or you, Alex, but you know, that MOPS people are often working behind the scenes and we're often not great at uh, tooting our own horn as much as we should be. Um, I think it's really important uh, always, but especially now, to be connected at the executive level to have that support for what we want to do. So use the opportunity to try to get a standing meeting on the calendar with your CMO or VP of marketing and your chief revenue officer, your VP of sales, have that discussion, get alignment on your roadmap. And that's going to build relationships and a way of working, you know, that's valuable far beyond this situation. Um, but the, the flux that things are in may create a unique opportunity to start some of those initiatives that may have been hard in the past. So, so you're essentially you're saying that because of the background, because of what's going on, uh, there will be more opening from those, uh, you know, executive to uh, to better understand the, you know, the the, the processes and how things works. Because now they they need they, they see things have changed. Is that what you're uh, what you're saying? They see things have changed, and they also see how much we need. I mean, we've all had that experience, I think, as operations people of getting the the you know getting voluntold like hey good news you're you're doing this you're doing that and and quite often these decisions are being made upstream from us meanwhile we have our own priorities that we're struggling sometimes to get buy-in for and so there's this conflict between um let's call it executive whimsy or, or executive priorities coming coming down the pipe and things that we see that are necessary um whereas if we are involved in that decision making or if you are in the room when those ideas start um, sometimes you can nip a terrible idea in the bud before that email hits your inbox and you're being told to do something. Or sometimes you can help guide it in a different way or seed um, things that you know are important priorities in the conversation a lot earlier. So just being able to, to get involved at that level. And I think from the executive perspective, um, they see that, that we're necessary, right? Because um, particularly in, in times like these, um, we're, we're going to keep the trains running. That's sort of what, what MOPS folk and operational folk more broadly, I think, do. So I think there could be a willingness, um, perhaps in some quarters, to do that. Whereas in the past, you know, it may be hard to find that time on a person's calendar. Mm -hmm. I, I would All say right. our, our executives are busier now than they were before. So, I mean, I'm lucky that, I mean, the luxury of working at, 
a small company means I have direct access to them anyway on Slack or wherever. I'm not going through three or four levels of management to get to somebody. So for me, it it hasn't changed, but it's because of the size of the company um, that I'm on those most of those standing meetings anyway. And um, so we communicate daily, but I can understand in a large organization, I don't know if if you'd be able to get access to those people more in this time or less or the same. I don't know, maybe Helen could comment on that. So from my point of view, it's important to uh, like build this uh, relationship before crisis. <laughs> like no matter, like it should start um, like, as soon as you are in a company, you should start working on it. And I think as soon as you can pull data and start like provide some kind of reporting and analytics, you will be pulled like we wanted to know it for the better world. <laughs> You'll be pulled in all kinds of meetings related to that. So I think it's more about. Um, kind of um, making sense of it and prioritizing this um, data related meetings reporting or analytics related meetings in your workload and make sure that they are answering the right questions because um, like it's going on like on the background all the time it's just important that now you have to own it you now have to explain what is going on what you see what you can see like outside of your organization and bring this in not just like as a regular bi-weekly, monthly meeting, but kind of like start start making it a priority, a big thing that you want to bring in. Mm -hmm. And that actually makes me think about, the, uh, you know, a little bit of a segue towards how should we essentially um, structure our, our team, right? So, so the question is more, how can we, how can the businesses structure um, their org chart to increase that alignment between the MOPs, between the executive, but also be, with the uh, sales operation as well? Because sometimes, you know, probably not true for you, Kelly Joe, where you're a smaller team, but probably very true for you, Elan, where you definitely have separate teams that are, up, you know, sales operation, marketing operations and stuff like that. So how, do you guys have any recommendations on how we should structure the org uh, to facilitate and increase that alignment between those two functions. This is, this is my my favorite topic. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> this is the topic that I speak on at every conference I speak at, mostly. So I have this role that I have, even though I'm uh, more on the technical side, even if I were in marketing operations in a more general role, I would still say the same thing. The relationships are up to the MOPS person to develop no matter which organization they sit in. It doesn't, it does, it does matter for other reasons, but as far as relationship building, that is your job. You have to yeah. forge those relationships with every stakeholder and every organization. In your own sales ops, sales, you better have, you better find your person in each of those organizations that you can rely on and have a relationship with. The where this role sits, um, changes for me because I have started in IT and systems and been moved to marketing more than once. So um, I've been back and forth and back and forth. And it's a very different job if you're sitting um, in the systems team because you are reporting to and your team members are all technical people. And you are, you know, it, it, so to me, it's a different, vibe or whatever you want to call it for a team. When you move to marketing, all of a sudden you're, you'll you'll notice that your priorities change. Um, you have different stakeholders, but you still have one foot on the systems team as well. And then the IT, because you still have to maintain all of those relationships. So as far as structuring, for it, it depends on the size of your company. It depends on uh, your go to market, like how you sell, what you sell. Um, how many people you have, and also where your expertise is. Like, I would never take somebody who was in this role with absolutely no marketing. Uh, this role doesn't work in IT if the person doesn't have a marketing background. Let me just say that. So that if, if this role were sitting in IT, uh, a lot of people make the mistake of just hiring somebody just super technical with no marketing background. That doesn't work. Um, no matter where it sits, I think it's a good idea to hire someone who understands business. So understands acquisition to closed one, 
lead flow, understands your sales cycle, your business model, all of those things. I mean, that's that's like your perfect unicorn, but if you have to hire one person, they need to have knowledge of all of those things. Um, but but I am I have learned time and time again over the last many changes in my career and moving in different organizations it doesn't ma really matter where you are it's up to you to forge the relationships and you to own what you do and make sure that everyone around you understands what you do and respects what you do and that 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 goes for no matter where you end up sitting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so really it's not about the where but it's really about building those relationships essentially i, I think so yeah ellen you want to add something to that yeah, uh, I feel the same kind of way that um, I was finding myself in multiple different structures and teams. But what I believe that um, this particular function has to have this executive support by all means. And it might be like in any different and bizarre way. It might be like someone on like totally different team. It's not necessarily like someone above you or like a few steps above you. But you need to find people who understand it and who can support you. And at the same time, um, it's kind of like you need to have someone above you to support and you need to have someone who help you like on your team. Like if you're just like one person and you're juggling like everything, well, I'm always trying to say like, this is not enough. Like if you want to achieve what you want to achieve, this is what is like, what, is, what should happen? Like how many people you need and like how it, it should be structured and like kind of like this contingency uh, or, um, like if we want to do A, then we need to have B. And be transparent and be honest. And like if something is happening, you are in this situation where like I I was trying to explain it before, right? Like yes, it's like I, I am telling that we are overwhelmed and we are running high risk of like making a mistake or like losing something. And like yes, I was very, very transparent about it. <laughs> and I think this transparency and this um very I, I would say honest and genuine approach to explaining and helping and like setting up our stakeholders up to kind of like success and to like understanding how they should help us to help them. I think this is the only uh, productive approach. Um, like we all can be complaining, we all can be kind of like criticizing <laughs> about like what's going on. I still think that we, we should keep this communication going. Um, sharing our thoughts and, um, and advice, basically, what should be happening in our team. And yeah, no play talk. Totally, I agree. And Justin, you wanna add anything there? Yeah, I mean, I feel very strongly about what, what both Kelly and, uh, and Helen have mentioned. Like you, if someone doesn't value and understand what you do, um, even if they're being unfair, even if it's unreasonable, it still falls back on you. I mean, no. We can all wait till the cows come home for people to suddenly realize how important and, and special we are. But at the end of the day, um, we've got to get out there. We've got to be distributing that message and forming those relationships because that's the only way we're really going to see change. From a from a, a mops sops relationship perspective, I I mean I I cut my teeth at a at a startup you know even way smaller than. Uh, than where Kelly Joe is right now. I was employee number five and like, it's like, all right, go implement Marketo, go implement Salesforce. So to have those functions actually be united under one, in my case, one person and eventually a small team was very natural. And I, it wasn't until I started consulting that I really understood the huge divide that exists between marketing and sales operations in some companies to the point where, you know, sometimes very difficult to even talk to them, get any time where, where Quite often, it's, it's sales ops who just does not um, care about the priorities of marketing or marketing operations and the huge dysfunction that that breeds. And I, I personally feel that if, if not a single function, at least um, very closely partnered, closely aligned, and intertwined functions you know, should be possible um, at, at all organizations. Although the roadmap to get there is going to be a lot harder in, in some cases than in others. Um, but at the very least, having some kind of understanding at the executive level that this is really one group with a shared mission. There are some requirements that are unique between marketing and sales, but at the end of the day, they are serving the revenue function. And then starting to build that partnership, whether it's a monthly 
you know, uh, meeting to work about a shared roadmap, whether it's having resources that sit with dotted lines to both teams and eventually, you know, building that even closer. But I, I think that has to happen and it's something that has to happen deliberately because just existing in those, those silos, um, it's too damaging and it's too wasteful. It's, it's hard work. I mean, actually, I find uh, in almost every company I've worked at, the relationship between uh, marketing ops and sales ops or sales is usually dysfunctional um, or, or it just hasn't been forged yet. You know, not dysfunctional. It's just like they haven't been talking enough. And so that's the first thing I usually do is try to create those relationships to get the other stakeholders to understand why it's important we work together and that everything we're doing is all for the common goal, right, of revenue. So everybody should be working in lockstep and understanding what each other does. You know, I think those are all really great comments, and we actually have a question uh, from the audience coming in along this topic, too. Uh, so, Warren, thank you for your comment. Um, the question um, is, do you think it's good to try and apply your expertise in other areas to get better relationships elsewhere in the business? And should you take a stand against things that you see could be done better? I I do that. Um, you don't want to step on people's toes, right? Other people have their their responsibilities, but I think if you can come to the table with um, a good explanation of a different option, um, not just say my way or the highway type of thing, but if you can come to the table and say, okay, I, I'm, your idea is fine, well, let me offer uh, something that I've seen work in the past somewhere else, and, um, but, I mean, explain it as an option, right? Because it's, if it's not your job to make that decision, it's not your job. But Helen mentioned, you know, to try to at least um, be a strategic thinker in this role. And part of being a strategic thinker is to let your opinions and experience be known to these other groups because they may not have um, a depth of experience you have in one area and they may appreciate you coming to the table with another solution. You know, you may not get your way, but at least you, you know, brought some strategic thinking to the table. And I think that's that's important for this role to do, just to do it in the right way. And I find it uh, very helpful to like you like we shouldn't think about anything that is happening in a personal way. And in many cases, like we shouldn't uh, demonize anyone around us, because in many cases, it's just like it's not a specific person or people or team who is like does not want to work with us or like counterproductive or something. In many cases, it's culture. In many cases, it's just misunderstanding and misalignment. And if you find like a way of talking and listening to those people and understanding where they're coming from, in many cases you'll be able to find a solution even like if it's like something some kind of control like somewhere between will be able to find the find those people Good. cool um i have time is flying very fast when it yeah. is a fun conversation um i'm just going to ask you for maybe a quick quick advice on uh, you know, for people that are feeling overwhelmed today or are uncertain about what's next like what would be your quick like three words or whatever uh, <laughs> advice so that people uh, can be more confident and feel better uh, moving forward. Mops people in general. <laughs> I mean, yes. I think we're always feeling overwhelmed. And what I generally um, say to people when I've managed teams in the past, when they're feeling overwhelmed is I say, we are not heart surgeons. Nobody is going to die on the table if you don't get that email out in an hour. Um, and seriously, let's take it for what it is, let's not make it something it's not. We are not surgeons and people, you know, it, it's, it's give people, let people breathe, let people make mistakes, it's okay. Um, you've gotta be able to, yeah, you gotta be able to give people a little slack, especially because the anxiety that is in all of us right now is, it affects the way you think, it affects your memory, it affects your health. Just having that amount of anxiety makes it really hard to focus at work for some people. And I think we just need to cut people some slack. And, you know, if you're feeling anxious and overwhelmed, well, join the club, right? We all are, and it's okay. It's okay to feel that way. Don't think you should feel normal right now because this is, we're not in any 
sort of normal, the new normal anyway, but I would say just give yourself a break and give everyone on your team a break. Cool. That's a good point. But for my side, um, at least that works for me, try to deconstruct your overwhelmness. Like why exactly, what's happening? And just like not to, don't pile it all in one big, huge, impossible thing. Just to try to separate and conquer, like <laughs> divide and conquer uh, what's going on and yeah, give yourself a, like a little bit of break. <laughs> priorities, right? Baby steps, lists. Yes. I make a lot of lists and I keep a lot of priorities. <laughs> and um, I just do one thing at a time because, right, if you look at everything that's on your plate, you're just going to feel even more anxiety. For, for me, for me, it comes down to four words: get off the computer. Um, <laughs> there, there, there's, a li there's a life outside of the digital realm, and especially it's funny. Even though we're working from home, we're kind of trapped in this never-ending work because we're always accessible uh, if we allow ourselves to be. So, you know, if you have if you have a backyard, go to your backyard. Or if you have a balcony, or just open a window, get some sunshine. And yeah, I, I echo what you said, Kelly Joe. Like, mm -hmm. no one's going to die. Um, and, and there is a life beyond this. And, and fortunately, uh, at least if, if we're not sick, if we still have a job, if we can work from home, we're way better off than millions and millions of people. So appreciate that. And, uh, you know, many things can wait till tomorrow. And I That's would it. say if you happen to be one of the people who was laid off, take this time to learn a new skill. If you mm -hmm. want to learn uh, marketing operations, this, if this is a new thing for you, there are so many companies offering free training right now and there's videos online and um, take this time because this is a, I mean, this was a great career choice for me. I'm telling you right now, it's just, yeah, I mean, this is, everybody needs this role and we need more of people like us. So if you're not in this industry, you could probably take a look at it and join the ranks and, and be employed before the end of this. Mm -hmm. Completely agree with that. Absolutely good time to learn new skills. Um, I think we're going to wrap this up here, Sarah. Um, I believe there is a, a ebook that we're offering for everybody that has been watching. And uh, do you want to talk about this? Sure. Uh, we do have a few resources for everyone. Um, so, of course, as we've been talking about, when a major event occurs such as this pandemic, there's always an economic consequence and um, COVID is no different. So amidst the uncertainty, there are steps that you should take to better position your company for what's to come. So we have created an ebook for you, a digital marketer's guide to crisis recovery ebook to help your MOPS team and what to consider. And there is also a MOPS crisis checklist in it. So we will include a link to download in your post webinar email. So please watch for that and open it and warn. Yes, I know you've received 6 million emails about COVID, but this one's a good one. So uh, watch for that. Um, the second resource that we have available for you is if you're in the, the boat of um, you're scrambling to get work done, or maybe you have uh, unqualified uh, team members who have to get campaigns out the door, this one's for you um, because we're offering a free six month license to Jetto. And Jetto, of course, helps reduce the manual processes of campaign execution and helps marketing teams get campaigns out the door. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, Jetto runs off the Marketo API and enables field marketers and other non-technical people uh, to create and launch marketing campaigns uh, without ever setting foot inside Marketo. So um, our gift to you to help the MOPS community during this time, uh, we are offering a free six month license and you'll want to sign up by April 30th to take advantage of this offer. You can see the URL on the screen or um, again, we will include a link um, in the post webinar email. Um, so, uh, Alex, did you want to offer a summary of the what we just talked about today? I mean, there's a couple of takeaways that I uh, took notes while I was uh, I was actually uh, listening. Um, so, essentially, one of the big thing is that you should really, really take this opportunity inside of your organization to uh, you know um, work on maybe on on stuff that were planned for. Like we saw with you, Kelly Joe, that you were able to move some of your uh, backlog or in a future project, now is a good opportunity to look at them. Uh, also, uh, Justin suggested to, uh, you know, retune some of your processes, look for maybe ways to optimize them. 
uh, you you may have some time right now to do this. Uh, documentation was a keyword also uh, that I got, uh, where um, making sure that you know your system is not all in your head, uh, making sure that you can share that, you can have other people get trained on it. Uh, definitely something that was uh, pretty um, pretty important. Uh, and then another point was to get closer to your executive. So we talked a lot about alignment. Doesn't really matter where you are in the organization. It's more about how you're building those relationships. And you shouldn't wait for a crisis to come to build those relationships. You should do it from uh, on the get-go in any new role, any new job. Uh, but uh, that is what is going to help you to continue to navigate through either a crisis or your normal job, because we all know that as MUPS, we're uh, you know most of the time overwhelmed, and the light is not necessarily all the time being shined at you know what we do and then the value that we bring to our organization. But I think the future is is bright for the MUPS. Uh, you know, uh, role and the future is bright for the organization that will value the work uh, and then the people that actually are bringing everything together to, you know, uh, uh, support all those go-to-market strategies. So that's what I have in a, you know, quick summary, uh, one minute, 32 seconds uh, wrap up. But uh, from there, I really, really want to, you know, say a big thank to uh, Helen, Kelly, Joe, and Justin, and of course, Sarah and the team to uh, put this together. I think it's a great opportunity to bring all the like-minded people uh, that helps you know to continue to move this uh, this function and this role uh, so again thank you very much i'm looking forward to keep the conversation going on social media or anywhere i know you guys are uh, pretty much visible <laughs> everywhere so uh, happy to uh, to keep that conversation going on that's great thank you alex uh, thank you justin kelly joe and helen for speaking today and thank you to all of you for joining us as you exit this presentation we will ask you a few short questions to ensure we're providing you with helpful content and your feedback is always greatly appreciated otherwise stay healthy be safe uh, and thank you again for spending time with us today thank you thank you, thank you.